I'm Cabot Phillips with Campus Reform. I'm joined now by Gabriel Nadalis of the Leadership Institute. Gabe, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. I want to talk to you about your transformation, going from a radical leftist member of Antifa to now a free speech advocate, someone that's on college campuses defending students' constitutional rights mm -hmm. on a daily basis. So I think it's important for us to start at the beginning. Sure. Uh, your political involvement, what got you involved in politics and led up to you coming to that place in life? Well, you know, before we start that, I really think it's important to mention what Antifa is. Uh, Antifa is not an organization, so a lot of people think it's this group that has meetings. No. Um, Antifa is made up of a lot of different organizations, and Antifa is more of a rally cry. The black mask is more of a uniform where you have a goal and you try to enact it as a, as a, as a group. So unfortunately, what you're left with is a mob mentality. And how did I get involved in politics? It was way back in 2009 when uh, Governor Schwarzenegger was cutting the arts and was cutting funding for schools. And I thought that I should, that I should uh, do something about it because I didn't want to have my, my favorite teacher get fired. That's really how it started. But honestly, my radical activism didn't start until 2010 when I refused to stand up for the Pledge of Allegiance. Why was that? Why didn't you stand for the pledge? What was going through your head? At the time, uh, I remember that I didn't believe in America. And I believe that uh, it was basically a fascist nation. So I didn't want to literally be forced to stand up for something I didn't believe. And uh, of course, I got in trouble. But I used the Constitution, which is ironic, to get away with it. Yeah. And so what, what were your main grievances with the United States? You didn't stand for the, the pledge. Were you being edgy, or was it actually substantive if you said, you know, I don't believe in America, all of these things? What were your grievances? Well, at the time, I remember that there was a lot of government bailouts of banks, and I thought that that was a problem with capitalism. Uh, I didn't understand that that was a form of cronyism, and it was actually a government's fault, not capitalism. And uh, on top of that, there was a lot of other... Uh, things that uh, we were going to war and I heard all this propaganda about how we were just uh, invading a, a bunch of different countries for oil, which is all propaganda now I see. And uh, it's just been a lot of different, it was a lot of different things. Yeah. At the time, it was more of uh, things that were out there for me, but it wasn't a, a defining ideology. Yeah, so some people would say it's radical not to stand up for the Pledge of Allegiance. But that's not as radical as actually going out and joining a group like Antifa. So what led up to that specific involvement? So that, I remember the first time I went to a rally was actually against neo-Nazis. I remember in 2010 they attended Claremont and I went there with a friend and that's how it started. I started going more and more protests and more marches. At some point I even organized some of them. Not organized them as like the whole, but I organized to have a presence there with a lot of people involved. Yeah. So I would uh, recruit people, I would call them and say, hey, who can make it? How do, we get to, how do we get there? Who can pay for gas? Who has a car? All these different details. I was definitely organizing a lot of um, activists on the left at the time. And so it started with a protest that a lot of people can get behind of something mm -hmm. protesting legitimate neo-Nazis. Yeah. And then you talk about how it transitions into protesting so many different people and giving them that label of Nazi, calling everyone a fascist, calling everyone a Nazi even when they aren't. What was that transition like? See, the problem, it was very easy for me to go up to somebody holding a, a, a swastika and yell at them. Incredibly simple. Yeah. But then after, when we went to other protests and we did other things, I was just told they're the same. They try to equate some people who were peaceful people who we just had disagreements with, and there's neo-Nazis. So it was more of a transition. Now, if you had told me to go yell at the people who are, uh, who are peaceful, I would have been like, no, I wouldn't do it. But uh, there was a transition that we try to equate all everybody in the same boat as these other hateful people. Yeah, and I think that's a tactic that's still being used right now uh, it, on it the is. far left of saying, okay, if we can get everyone to agree that Nazis are bad, far left or far crazy far right radicals are bad, fascists are bad, okay, we all agree on that, yep. great. Now all we have to do is expand the definition of what we yeah, it label is. those things. It is, and it's really easy. I remember, as a matter of fact, once was, when I was a conservative, I was at uh, California State University, Los Angeles, and it was uh, near a riot when Ben Shapiro spoke. And I remember talking to a few students out there, you know, as a person of color, I can get away with uh, like talking to the left. I'd still do that routinely just to hear what they have to say. There was this girl there, and she was a student, and she told me that Ben Shapiro was a neo-Nazi and she, that he hated black people and he hated Jews. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, he's Jewish. And this is the mentality that Antifa and all these organizations have. It's not just that you disagree with them, it's that they are the most hateful person that you can probably think of. 
and this is why we should protest against them. Yeah, and so you started organizing protests, organizing riots, whatever you want to you want to call them. Uh, what was your experience like behind the mask? So you're masking up. We see pictures. We have some pictures here on the screen of, of your involvement. What was going through your head when you're looking out at the other side, and, and what was your goal? It really depends what the protest was for. I mean, uh, but it, it's either to shut them down or to drive them out of the city or to force them to change policies. Uh, I remember there was a time where we protested a CEO in his Newport Beach home, and we were yelling obscenities out at him. And the funny part is he wasn't there, and we knew he wasn't there. Yeah. Because it was never to yell at him or make him listen to us. It was for us to annoy the neighbors, to all these little children learning bad words from us. So then once we're gone, the neighbors could go knock on his door and say, you need to do whatever the hell they want. Yeah. And this is the way Antifa is. You, we don't care about, or they don't care about uh, arguing with you, having a conversation. They want to shut you down, or if you don't want to change your, your ways, you need to get out of the city. Yeah, and so you talk about this mentality by any means necessary, as some people know it now. What did that mean to you at the time, by any means necessary? By any means necessary. Um, it's pretty harsh. At the time, I didn't really think about it uh, in the terms of like open warfare or you know even taking up arms, but I it did allow me to under or to accept destruction of property. As a matter of fact, I even saw a cop get punched once by one of my friends. And it was just very acceptable for us to, to do this, because if they were defending fascists, then they deserve to be punched. And so that didn't bother you? No, it didn't bother me, at the time at least. Because they were equated with fascism in your yeah. mind and any means necessary. Yes. I mean, there's this thing that says, like, sure, if um, they're actual Nazis and they're actually trying to kill people, then you have to take up arms. Obviously, a lot of people are not. But if they're really trying to uh, do harm to others, like physical harm to others, then we should stand up to them and we should act with violence, but only to defend ourselves. Yeah. And what Antifa does is that they are the ones starting the violence. Yeah, and so did that bother you? Were there parts where you would come back from a protest, you will have seen violence up close, you will have seen threats and intimidation. Were you bothered at the time or did you feel like you were this you know, warrior for a good cause? It, we just laughed about it. We would tell the stories like, oh, did you see that? And we'd laugh about it. And when nobody really said anything, criticized it, because everybody was pretty much okay with it. Yeah. At the time, it was just like this big joke, like, oh, yeah, we stood up against cops. We stood up against all these people. It just seemed like a big joke. And you, you touched earlier on the mob mentality. Yeah. It's really How did that manifest itself? We, all, we were all just okay with uh, the idea of, like, tearing... <laughs> We were okay with the idea of uh, just destroying property. As a matter of fact, there is a song by Ostraden, which is from this band. It's called They Ignore a Peaceful Protest. And in the song, it actually says, um, if they ignore a peaceful protest, they can't ignore a burning police car. They can't ignore rocks and bricks. And this is the mentality that everyone had. Uh, if the media is going to ignore what we're trying to do, well, we're going to force them to cover us. Yeah. Were there moments you were scared? Uh, yeah. There was one time where I, we were trying to break down a door, and I was right there at the front, like hitting the, hitting the door, trying to break it down. And there was uh, a, an officer on a horse, and I remember that he was trying to disperse the crowd, et cetera. And I didn't realize it at the time until I found a video of it much later on. But my friend just pulled me away, and he like just like he hugged me, and he he just pulled me, and I was in shock because I'm like, oh shoot, I'm gonna get arrested. But it was just my friend, and I, I probably would have like been hit by the horse because yeah. it was coming pretty fast. So it was looking back, yeah, looking back, it's it one was. of those things. Uh, you kind of think about those things, and you, I don't even know how I did. I used to do that stuff. Yeah, and so what led to the change? Were there, were there moments where what were the moments where you started to say, maybe this whole crazy Antifa thing isn't for me. What, what were those moments like? You know, it really goes into high school. And I remember in high school, I started reading, uh, I started, I was failing my econ class. So I started reading my econ Some people book. watching might not find that as a surprise <laughs> uh, after hearing what group you were in. Yeah, so I actually started reading my econ book. So I learned a lot of different things. Uh, and I remember I got, a, I got to be in the class, so that was pretty cool. But uh, I took those ideas home. And I took them to a lot of the, my friends. I would ask them a lot of different questions about them. I'm like, oh, well, what do you think about uh, free markets and all these things? I think they make sense if we do this. And instead of saying, you know, having a conversation or saying, no, 
you know, free markets don't work because A, B, C, or whatever. They called me names. They called me. First time as an anarchist I'd ever been called a capitalist pig. <laughs> All because you were raising questions. Literally just raising questions. I wasn't even advocating it. Yeah. I was literally challenging uh, just beliefs. Because I think it's very important for us to challenge our beliefs to make sure that we actually have a strong argument. And they weren't about that. They just they started calling me names and they said that I needed to shut up. So that made you question the legitimacy of the movement, I guess. Really of did. If you can't question yourself, yeah. how are you going to grow? How are you going to become stronger? Yeah. Because the only types of criticisms that the left really takes, at least Antifa and all these organizations, is criticisms from the left. Or if they are very much leftist or, um, I remember one specific one, we would talk about personal property versus private property. In my mind today, I think they're the same thing. But they would say, oh, you can own your toothbrush, but you can't own a house. And those are the types of debates that would be in a very narrow ideological field. But if they said, well, what if you can own a house? Or what if the free markets are good? Then you're a fascist. Yeah. So, so you started to have these questions, mm -hmm. uh, moments of doubt. When did that actually lead to you saying, I don't want to be in this group anymore? When did your personal philosophy and your actions start to change? As a matter of fact, uh, I was still a leftist all into college. And, but I started looking into uh, a lot of online resources. And I remember I requested information online. And that's when the Leadership Institute found me. Um, Adam Weinberg is somebody that I, I still give him a call from time to time and thank him and just see what he's up to. Yeah. Uh, so that changed the trajectory of your life. It really did. Because, I mean, I, I, would, I remember one time I went into Pasadena uh, and I went into a bookstore and I went in and asked, hey, do you guys have any radical literature? And then they were like, well, what kind of radical are you thinking? He was about to go show me the Communist Manifesto, et cetera. And I said, the Federalist Papers. That was my mindset back then. That was radical for you? Yeah, for me, radical. And, and the founding of our nation was radical, and the ideas be behind that. And I remember that Adam, every time I would have a question from the left or from the right, he wouldn't call me names. He wouldn't tell me that uh, that was wrong. He would just he would listen, and he would say, well, that's interesting, but have you ever thought of this? Or have you ever thought of that? And he gave me the, the law, which I think is a great book. Yeah. And so that, it was the, the steady transition. It's a steady so it wasn't transition. even a light bulb moment. It was the it more you read. The more I read, the more I talked to uh, conservatives, the more I understood what they were trying to say. And so when did you realize the ideas of free speech, meaning we have an exchange of ideas, not meaning I'm going to use my power, my speech, to silence you, as, which is what you were doing at the time. What was that realization of the importance of the First Amendment and free speech like? That was when my college tried silencing me. What happened? Uh, I, as I mentioned, I started a Young Americans for Liberty chapter. And I remember that uh, the student government advisor told our advisor to not be our advisor. And he, she, I don't know exactly what she said, but I remember they had a conversation. He told me that he couldn't be our advisor anymore because we were doing something wrong, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I mean, they tried to do thing after thing to try to silence us, whether it be um, making, making it difficult for us to get recognized making it difficult for us to have an event, or even they threatened us with a legal lawsuit at one point. Yeah. Um, they, they kept doing that. So when you look back on your time on the radical left, mm -hmm. when you see those pictures that we showed earlier, what comes to mind? What's your thought? I just, I am an incredibly different person I am then from that time. And I can't believe that I used to do all that. It's, it's, it doesn't make sense to me why I would take, put on a mask and yell obscenity at that person. I don't even cuss nowadays, <laughs> like at all. Yeah. And like now I used to do it in front of a, a in, to some random person I didn't know in front of a bunch of children playing on the front yards. Shock factor. Yeah, it just, I didn't, I don't understand why it would make me do that and be so hateful. Yeah, so that's all in your past now. What's your present? What are you doing right now to, to make campuses a better place and, and defend free speech? So I'm really happy about what I do now. Uh, I help conservative students in California and throughout the nation, really. Just I help them uh, fight back against liberal bias against their schools. Did you ever think you'd be doing that? No, there's no way. I mean, I, I, at the time, I remember when I was in Tifa, I wanted to be a musician. I know how to play multiple instruments, and I wanted to be a music composer. And just getting involved into defending conservatives, which is something that at the time I hated, I, I, there's no way I, I could ever see myself doing this. Yeah, and so what's, what's the best part of your job? My best part of my job is that multiple times at multiple different universities, small, 
private, big state schools and major schools like Berkeley, I've gotten phone calls and I've gotten messages and handwritten letters from students like just thanking me, saying that they felt scared and they were able to uh, fight back against the bias that they, they faced because of what I did and what the Leadership Institute does. What would your message be to high school you before you ever got involved in any of this? What do you wish you could have told yourself then? Just listen. Listen to other people. Don't be so narrow-minded. And what, if you feel that something's wrong or that you have a little bit of a doubt of something, speak out. Because the moment I started speaking out is the, re the moment that I realized that my allies weren't my friends. Hmm. All right, we'll leave it there. Gabriel Nadalis, thanks so much for this important conversation, hopefully one that people will learn from. And uh, thank you for all the work you're doing right now uh, to make campuses a better place. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I'm Kevin Phillips with Campus Reform. Thanks so much for watching. If you want to donate to help us make more videos just like that, you can click right here. And if you want to be the first person to see all of our new content, click the subscribe button right here. Please, click one of them. Doesn't have to be both. One or the other. Okay. Thanks.